Hey guys, so we've been talking about Egypt and Mesopotamia for a while now, but what we're going to be talking about today are a couple important cultures that existed in the land between Egypt and Mesopotamia. And these places are called Phoenicia and Israel. So we're going to start out like we always do with geography. And the place where Phoenicia and Israel are is called the Levant. And so the Levant is at the western edge of the Fertile Crescent. It's basically a thin strip of green between the Mediterranean Sea and the Arabian Desert. And the Fertile Crescent runs up the side of the Mediterranean Sea, over the top of the Arabian Desert, and then back down the Tigris and the Euphrates, making what looks like a crescent to some people. Uh, so something interesting about the Levant is it's located in between the great civilizations of Egypt and Mesopotamia. And so what this means is that as time goes on, they get influenced by both of these civilizations, and they live at a sort of cultural crossroads. And this means that they get the ideas from both civilizations, and then they also control important trade routes, which makes them in a, puts them in a perfect position to trade with these other places. Uh, it also makes them politically unstable. And so that, what that means is that they are constantly being conquered, first by Mesopotamia, and then by Egypt, and then by Mesopotamia again, over and over throughout their history. Rather than starting empires, these guys are incorporated into empires. So let's start out by talking about the Phoenician city-states. So Phoenicia never referred to a single united uh, group. It's not like an empire. All the Phoenician cities remain independent, which is why they're city-states. But they still become extremely important, even though they never become the center of an empire. And the reason for this is that they become extremely important economically. They're always trading and exchanging and creating important goods that the other empires need. So even though they're tiny compared to these vast empires, because they have this economic power, because they can make stuff and trade, uh, they still do well and become pretty powerful. So because Phoenicia is an economic power, we need to talk about the Phoenician economy. What do they make? What do they trade? Uh, why does everybody care about them so much? Uh, well, so the leading city-states were these three called Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos. And these three states were on the ocean, and they would do all sorts of important stuff. Uh, first of all, they would send out merchants and sailors to pr procure all sorts of rare materials. They would send out people on boats to fetch timber from Europe, or they would cut down cedar trees that grew nearby, some of the only timber in the Middle East that could be used for stuff. They would go all the way up to Great Britain to mine tin, and bring tin back on their boats so bronze could be made, and gold also. So they'd sail all over the place seeking these rare materials. And then what would happen is in the Phoenician cities, they had some of the greatest merchants, or some of the greatest craftsmen of the ancient world, who could take these raw materials and turn them into amazing things. They could make this really great purple dye that people wanted all over the place. Uh, in fact, Phoenicia became known for this purple dye more than anything else. They could also manufacture bronze, and they could manufacture ships, and some of the first books. And in fact, Byblos, one of the city-states, gave its name to the very first books. And that's where our words like Bible, or the Spanish word for library, bibliotech, comes from, is from Byblos, this ancient city-state. And so then, once they got all this awesome stuff and created all of these desirable items, they would trade these for profit or for protection. And so remember, the second step of empire is to take stuff, right? So people would conquer these different city-states, and rather than destroy them, these city-states could just give the empires some of, their, some of this awesome stuff they make, and that way the empires would not would not destroy them, but would rather just leave them alone and let them keep doing their awesome trading stuff. Well, the Phoenicians achieved some pretty awesome stuff in their time. First of all, they were some of the first uh, marine explorers, naval explorers rather. So they sent out their ships all over the Mediterranean. Then they even sailed out of the Mediterranean and sailed down the coast of Africa, Another a feat that wouldn't be achieved again until the Portuguese did it like a like 2,000 years later. 
Uh, also, they sent ships all the way up to Britain and made some of the first contact with the, the hunter-gatherers and the Neolithic people that lived in Great Britain. They also founded a great city known as Carthage, which would become important later on as the main rival of the Roman Empire. They also invented the first alphabet. And so the alphabet is much easier to use than any of the earlier systems of writing. So cuneiform and hieroglyphics, while they were useful, were extremely complicated. But the alphabet is really simple. In the hieroglyphics, you had thousands and thousands of different characters. Uh, same thing with cuneiform. But with the first alphabet, you only have 25 or 26 symbols. And using these 26 symbols, you can create all the words in a language. And so this is very important because it makes it easier to communicate and it makes it easier for normal people to learn how to read and write. And so this system of pass passing on knowledge is advanced by the Phoenicians. So the other society that lives in the Levant, and they live south of ancient Phoenicia, is ancient Israel. And we don't know too much about their origins except what is said in the Torah. And so the Torah is also known as the Old Testament, and it is the uh, religious scripture that Jews have passed down for thousands of years. And so the Torah gives us a legendary account of where ancient Israel came from. But of course, we have to remember that this might be a biased source, so we need to be careful about how we interpret it. Anyway, the Torah says that Abraham, who was the founder of the people of Israel, led a small group of semi-nomadic people out of Mesopotamia to the Levant, crossing the desert. Uh, but once they reach the Levant, famine forces the Israelites to go into slavery in Egypt. Uh, this lasts for a while, but then another very important figure in Judaism, Moses, leads the Israelites to freedom out of Egypt back to the Levant around 12,000 BC, or at least that's when historians think that happened. So once the Jews who are being led by Moses make it back to Israel, they conquer the southern Levant. And in fact, they do it rather harshly and burn several cities to the ground and kill a bunch of people. Uh, but so after they conquer this territory, a couple of powerful kings emerge, and these kings establish the kingdom of Israel, and they build their capital city of Jerusalem in around 1000 BC. And so what's interesting is these guys, they don't rule as gods. Remember how the Pharaoh and the Mesopotamian kid, kings rule as gods, or as the descendants of gods. That is not what David and Solomon do. Instead, they rule as the servant of God. Uh, so anyway, uh, Israel splits into two kingdoms and is actually split for most of its time as an independent country. So for 200 years, it splits into Judah and Israel, and they disagree about all sorts of stuff. But eventually, uh, in 722, they are conquered by the Assyrian Empire, and the Assyrians burn down a bunch of stuff, take a bunch of stuff, and Israel is never the same. Uh, then what happens even later is another empire comes, the Neo-Babylonians, and they conquer uh, Israel again. And not only do they conquer it, but they deport all of the people who live in Israel out of there and take them back to Mesopotamia. So this is the strategy of deportation that Assyria first practiced. The Babylonians use it on the Jews. Well, so anyway, um, Basically, after Assyria conquers Israel, Israel ceases to exist as an independent country. Yes, but so this causes the beginning of the Jewish diaspora. And diaspora means that a group of people uh, who continue to see themselves as a group spreads out across the world. And so the Jews have lost their homeland in Israel, but they continue to see themselves as Jews and to hold the same religious beliefs. And they begin to spread out all throughout the world, uh, up into Europe and throughout the Middle East. And this makes them what has been known as a diaspora people. They're spreading out throughout the world. 
But so Israel is important more for its religious practices than for its political achievements. And its lasting religious uh, contribution to the world is monotheism. They are the first group that believes in only one all-powerful God. Uh, and they call this God Yahweh. And they believe that Yahweh has chosen the Jews to be uh, basically the chosen people on earth. And this goes all the way back to Abraham. They believe that Abraham made an agreement with God called the covenant. A covenant is just a fancy word for an agreement. But in this agreement, God says that he will make Israel the chosen nation and ensure that the nation of Israel spreads out across the earth and prospers for eternity. In return for this, Abraham has to promise that the people of Israel will uphold certain religious practices. Uh, first, he has to agree that the Jews will maintain certain ritual practices. This includes stuff like not doing anything, anything on the day of Sabbath, and also certain complex forms of sacrifice. Uh, so in the temple in Jerusalem, uh, the king would sacrifice a sheep in a specific way that was supposed to be pleasing to Yahweh. This is one of the things that the Jews had to do to please the God. And this is not that different from what the people in Mesopotamia and Egypt have been doing for a long time. But something else is that they have to maintain a certain code of ethics. And so what this means is that uh, Yahweh doesn't just want them to do rituals. He doesn't just want sacrificed sheep. He wants the Jews to live in an ethically correct way. And so only if the Jews live in an ethically correct way, that is, if they do the right thing all the time, will the covenant be maintained. So if the Jews live righteously, if they do the right thing and follow this code of moral behavior, then Yahweh will ensure that they spread out throughout the earth and succeed and enjoy the fruits of successful government. But if they don't do this, then they will be punished for breaking the rule of the covenant. Right, so Judaism is really important because even though it remains a small religion that never spreads out to very many people, its core ideas are taken up by both Christianity and Islam. And Christianity and Islam today account for over 50% of uh, the world's population. More than 50% of the world is either a Christian or a Muslim. And both of these ideas go back to Judaism. In fact, most Christians and most uh, Muslims believe that their God is the same God that is talked about in the Torah. So Yahweh, the God of the Jews, is also worshipped indirectly by Christians and by Muslims, which makes it kind of weird that there has historically been so much conflict between the two groups, because after all, they worship the same guy. But anyway, it's complicated. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so here are the key terms. There are a lot of them. We can talk about them tomorrow in class. Um, yeah, don't get overwhelmed. That's all.